Hello all, this is the owl, and okay, one more Made in Abyss video, and then something different. Yeah, I know, this may as well be a Made in Abyss channel right now. Anywho, last time, we talked about the various zoological and biological inspirations for certain aspects of the series, particularly the monsters of the abyss and some of its natural phenomena, such as the curse. Today, we're getting a little more esoteric. We'll be delving into the various mythological, theological, and folklore inspirations for the story. But before we get rolling, please keep in mind that all of this is basically me blue-skying. This isn't a thesis, and I don't think much of this could be proven. And as always seems to happen to me, it could well end up being contradicted by newer chapters or Tsukushi himself. With that out of the way, let's get cracking. I shall tell you where we are. We are in the most extreme and utter region of the human mind. A radiant abyss where men meet themselves. Hell, Netly. We are in hell. For quite some time, people, particularly Western audiences, believed that the abyss itself was inspired by Judeo-Christian hell, particularly the version described in Dante's Inferno, with its various distinct rings. However, Tsukushi later clarified that while, yeah, the abyss was indeed inspired by hell, it was the Buddhist version, not the Christian version. Sort of. Now, keeping in mind I am no theologian, and that the various interpretations of hell within Buddhism are as complicated as, well, hell. <laughs> and this is made even trickier by the Japanese faith, which tends to vary from person to person and region to region, and exists more as an amalgamation of traditional Shinto, Buddhist, Confucian, and Tao dogma. And yes, please also keep in mind that everything ahead is likely a massive oversimplification of an incredibly varied and complicated belief system. Not trying to tread on anyone's toes here. See, there are some fascinating parallels, not only between hell and the abyss itself, but also the various layers of hell. Generally known as Jigoku. No, I am not even going to try to pronounce the original terms for these is the most clear visual inspiration, with its layers of ever-intensifying torment, including one where you are forced to hurt, kill, and eat other people to survive. Sound familiar? However, there are also some similarities to Meido, which is another bag of metis entirely. Meido is likely most analogous to purgatory, a place where people who are neither good enough for Tengoku, heaven, reincarnation, or bad enough for Jigoku, hell, although there are some similarities to the classic Pilgrim's Progress. In Meido, these souls are put through some pretty brutal trials, as part of a long journey, which culminates in them being sent to one of these three things. But seriously, if you are interested in this stuff, do some reading on Meido, as it's bloody fascinating. 
probably the trippiest thing you'll read this year, and you'll find all sorts of similarities, not only to Maiden Abyss, but to Japanese folk tales like Momotaro. The journey of the dead is long, grueling, and pretty nightmarish, involving a seemingly endless series of tests and trials that generally involve you being horribly tortured in some fashion. And if you fail, you get sent straight to hell. It's basically a Saw movie, and I'm not entirely kidding with that. But not only does this journey have a certain narrative resonance with Rikor's own pilgrimage to the bottom of the abyss, remember, Rikor is, in a sense, already dead. Many of these trials are quite similar to the challenges faced by the party, including crossing desolate landscapes filled with monsters, being attacked by strange birds who mimic human speech, rains of boiling iron, and hazardous massive rivers, not to mention demons who take great pleasure in removing skin, limbs, and organs. Yeah, as I make this video, I realize that this should probably have had more parts, as there's tons more to talk about here. For instance, how Bondrood and Shaka Nyorai have rather a lot of similarities. Finally, the entire story has a lot of similarities to the Greek myth of Orpheus and the Japanese myth of Izanagi and Izanami, which in turn has itself a lot of similarities to the Greek myth of Persephone. I would love to know whether this is a coincidence, or if not, how on earth the story traveled to Japan. Without going into too many details, the common thread in these stories is a loved one dying, and someone descending into the underworld to find them, which inevitably ends in tragedy. Orpheus did a dumbass thing, right as he was about to escape, which doomed his wife to hell forever. And the Izanagi Izanami tale is even darker, because when Izanagi found his wife, she had been rotted by hell, resulting in him betraying her and leaving her there deliberately, sealing her in, which caused her to basically turn into death. Yeah, Japanese mythology is frigging weird. And I have to wonder if any of this stuff is going to come up later, especially as we move into layer 7. Oh, and speaking of the Greek underworld, there are also certain aspects of the story that remind me a lot of Tartarus, yet another Greek underworld, particularly the fact that it was guarded by a terrible hydra and other monsters. Yeah, there's lots of Greek stuff in this story. However, this all ties rather neatly into the next bit, which is somehow both a bit more tenuous and even more interesting. Let's take a look. One of the core themes running through the entire Leviathan Idubudu arc is that of value, which is later expressed as five different stages. This is pretty esoteric, as it represents not only what something is worth, but also a wibbly-wobbly value in and of itself, based on self-actualization and epiphany. Yes, all of this is very abstract, by the way, so I am going to sort of guess here. But another YouTuber who I'm not sure how to pronounce did a video on value, and I have linked it in the description. Now, value does have an interesting parallel to Buddhism, yet again, with different Buddhist philosophies and texts describing the various stages of enlightenment. And yes, again, this stuff is way more complicated than I can explain in this dumb little video, so if you are interested, there are literally libraries of this stuff to read. However, the core themes are abandoning selfish, damaging desires, not isolating yourself, shedding hatred and vengeful thoughts, and not performing harmful practices. And this, in the story, 
is very much the exact arc best foxy moth owl girl for Puta undergoes when she puts aside her desire for revenge against the Narehate of the village. She obtains a new stage of power, value, or perhaps enlightenment, which I suspect is represented by the balancing going from black to white, and her own eyes getting a special pattern. Damn it, that's cool. So let's leave religion alone for a little bit, and look at stuff a bit less tenuous. What do I mean? Well, The Ganja Expedition, who later became Iduburu, headed down into the abyss in search of Shoro, the legendary city of gold. As I mentioned in part 5 of my deep dive series, this was almost certainly inspired by El Dorado, and possibly the city of Zed, but El Dorado is most likely due to the definite Spanish influences on the design of the expedition and the characters. Now, I am not going to go super deep into either of these stories, but they are rather intertwined. Tales of an ancient city, either populated by or once populated by an advanced pre-Columbian civilization, filled to the brim with valuable gems, gold and artifacts hiding somewhere within the dark depths of the Amazon and this makes its way into rather a few manga and anime, most notably One Piece, which not only bases quite a few story beats on El Dorado, but its characters on explorers that went in search of it, at least their names. One specific expedition springs to mind, Percy Fawcett's ill-fated journey into the Amazon jungle to locate the city of Zed which, again, many believe to be El Dorado itself. In 1924, Fawcett, an experienced explorer and adventurer, and a man utterly obsessed with the Amazon, as well as two other companions, Jack and Walter Rayleigh, another absolutely fascinating man. Seriously, as with a lot of stuff I am bringing up in this video, please do yourself a favor and go and read up on it yourself there's so much interesting stuff here, ventured into the Amazon in search of Zed. They were seasoned adventurers, well provisioned and on good terms with most of the native tribes. Several months later, after last being sighted at Dead Horse Camp, they completely vanished, never to be seen again. What actually happened to the Fawcett party is a mystery even today, complicated by contradictory oral histories and stories from local tribes, and all sorts of weird evidence and occurrences, leading to wild stories about him finding the city and settling there, starting a cult, tales of cannibalism, and all sorts of fun stuff with secret societies, aliens, monsters, all that good shit. There was even a movie made about this which is kind of good. I have to wonder if this at least partially inspired Rico's own journey. There are a few other expeditions that might have had some influence on the story, but maybe another time. As we close in on the end here, there are a few final things that I want to mention that didn't really fit in well elsewhere. First up, fairy tales. The similarities between Maiden Abyss and several fairy tales could, you know, easily be a video of their own. If there's interest, I might do another video on this. But, well, there's a reason I often call Maiden Abyss a dark fairy tale, and it's not just because of the art, it's because, narratively speaking, it does strongly resemble one. Similarities to Hansel and Gretel, 
a whole wadge of stories about a girl embarking on a sort of dangerous quest into an unknown land and finding a male guardian along the way, as well as plenty of familiar elements, such as the wicked stepmother, seriously that design man, the witch in her house, soup made of kids, the charlatan wizard, yeah, as I said, this probably should have been a three-parter, so I'll leave this one here, because bloody hell, there is a lot more to say. Next up, QB, the famous nine-tailed fox spirit, well known in Japan and popularized globally by Naruto, is a story going back thousands of years in Japan. Fox spirits are another iceberg I'll mostly avoid, but in a nutshell, they are mischievous, can be good or evil, sometimes both at the same time, are often represented as hypersexual or at least desiring to bear children, often to a human mate, can shapeshift, and the nine-tailed variation is both omniscient and immortal. Sounding like anyone yet? And finally, some Greek myth. We already talked about Tartarus earlier, and I've mentioned Sparagmos in other videos, but the one connection I find interesting here is the story of Prometheus, particularly the aspect of the story where Prometheus is condemned to an endless cycle of being eaten and regenerating, only to be eaten again. This is precisely the fate that Anachi foresaw for Mitty, which actually sort of ended up happening, and is also very much what happened to Faputa during the war for Iduburu. Once again, I have nothing concrete here, but it's still interesting. And I think my voice might be going out, so I'm going to call it here. There we have it, a ton of interesting connections to the story, theological, mythological, and historical. I've barely even scratched the surface here, trust me. So again, if there is enough interest, this may have to get another part. But until then, I am in need of a cup of hot tea. Take care my friends, and I'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, why not stick around? There's some really really cool stuff coming up next month, including, yeah, that's gonna be fun. If you want to help us out, and put a great big smile on the lovely Mrs. Owl's face, you could always head over to our Patreon. And if you want to come over, shoot the shit, give feedback or suggestions, why not come and join our Discord? It's actually kind of been popping off recently, and it's just, ah oh man, so wholesome. Anyways, cheers, this is the owl, signing off.